first to thank, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, Brad, to give me the opportunity to talk. Um, so I'm from the uh, AI lab, Intel. Um, so the core and the core of our business is to trying to build um, deep learning uh, hardware accelerators. Uh, but you know, apart from that, you know, uh, in, addition, in addition to that, we also do awesome research. So I want, really want to show with this crowd uh, some recent research we have done. So the, the, the research I'm going to present today is encapsulated in this small paper. And um, I would say it's mainly my um, you know, colleagues, Andy and Sharad. They're really awesome. I'm really just cheerleading for them. And this is a very interesting uh, small paper. Uh, that I think it's, um, it's going to touch on a little bit of biological in inspiration that we are all talking about here. And uh, we had a little bit of discussion uh, last night, and I think you know, a lot of AI groups uh, like ours um, probably has the closest semblance of some of the um, you know, properties that we were talking about yesterday about like a young people's organization that's really enthusiastic about AI and trying to figure out things. And really, so I mean, just by the criteria uh, we had yesterday, uh, under 30, under 30, you wish. OK, so since I have a copious 10 minutes to present the whole work, and it's just yet another deep learning paper, so I'd like to uh, take maybe a couple of slides to go through some like philosophical things that we've been talking about. So, so I have biological inspiration in my title. So what is really biological inspiration? And I've been a neuroscientist, and uh, I've been a neuromorphic hardware project later on before I'm doing deep learning research. Um, I think Terry mentioned that uh, in, on the first day that we want principles, we don't want details. And I think, I think everybody agrees with that. But I think for this issue, uh, there's a little bit of a nuance to that. So basically, practically, um, you, know, you start with some principles, and that will constrain your design. And you, you can you know, be faithful to details, uh, more or less. And that's really a kind of where you choose this point on this, this whole continuum. And this actually, I would argue, uh, tended to divide people's opinions. For example, let's, give you a, let's say you're just doing spiking neural network design. Do, do you think Dale's law is a principle or a detail? I mean, is this something that you want to be faithful to, or you, you can throw it away? So I think, um, and a lot of people uh, said during this conference that we, we really know very little, and there's a lot of re research we need to do. And I kind of you know, tend to agree with that. So really, the jury is out, or, or really, the case is not even tried. So we should, all the algorithm researchers really should be allowed, should have the freedom to explore this whole, whole uh, spectrum. So, but, but of course, we know that the two extreme ends are not good, because you have to start with some constraint. I mean, no free lunch. Um, but blindly copying every single detail of biology is not, also not a good idea. So you know, whether you want to stick with strictly spiking networks, or you want to relax it to some more uh, general like framework, like uh, asynchronously, event-driven communicating um, um, state machines, that's up to you. But the bottom line is we need to do sound engineering. We need to have sound benchmarks you know, um, to figure out what really works and what really didn't work. So I'm, I'm really not trying to you know, sell this as a, as, as a negative message. Um, so a little bit of personal experience. I mean, I, I was on a, a you know, neuromorphic hardware um, project that didn't carry through. And um, let's say just for an example, let's say Dale's Law. And if you're a you know, neuromorphic algorithm researcher and you really want to break it, but let's say on the early days, um, all the tools that's available to neuromorphic uh, algorithm researchers are basically tools for simulating biological networks that basically didn't allow you to break Dale's Law. Um, that, that would be bad, right? So I, I would say you know, it is really not like um, the people that I worked with on that project is, is just not good. I mean, those are the most brilliant people I've ever worked with. We have a great team, and we continue to work on some other things. Um, but I think really the problem is that um, you know, we should really blame ourselves, because my, myself is an algorithm researcher. Um, so 
we really need to take the responsibility. And we need to, if it is some tool that's really not at the right level of abstraction, we really need to just, you know, just don't settle and just build out your own or guide, um, you know, our tool builders. And, um, and I'm glad to see the development of the field is really leading to this direction. And I'm the loudest shout to our colleagues uh, in Intel Labs, Mike's team, and I think, you know, Loi, he's just, it's just awesome. And I really hoped back a few years I, I could have that. And it's, you know, tools will enable fl very flexible algorithm research. And, you know, it's really it's, it's two, two, foot, uh, two feet. Okay, so another question I think I, we, we, we heard a lot uh, issue um, in the past couple of days is really, is there really a fundamental difference between deep learning and neuromorphic engineering? I mean, I heard a lot of, you know, kind of hostile. Um, so I, I've been on both, both sides. So I, I would argue that um, there's really no need for each side to demonize the other. And, um, and it's really we're just, Probably the difference is kind of more graded on where on this spectrum uh, we we think, and I'm really glad to see like neuromorphic um, algorithm researchers are more and more um, um, you know designing their networks based on first principle, and that's really the reason why I'm a big fan of a lot of your work uh, here, and um, applaud to you, and also I think perhaps this. This talk will be a little data point to you to also show you that deep learning is really not, not biologically inspired. And there's a lot of element like that in deep learning. OK, so I, I don't see any like rotten egg flying. So maybe now I switch to, OK, um, maybe my personal experience again. So you know the. Um, well, I was a young researcher, and I had a little bit of a tortuous um, career path. But you know, guess what? I'm doing deep learning right now, and it's really different. And I and I really found some really interesting um, kind of properties, in, in, in interesting discoveries in, in when I get into this field. Uh, the first thing that I found is really there's a flood of papers. I mean, the, the time scale in this field is just really different. Papers coming out every day. So I spent a lot of time reading and just trying to keep, keep up with, with the field. And it then seems that like, uh, because deep learning is so successful that people are pretty much exhausting all possible you know, things in the solution space. And that's my first observation. And what's more amazing is probably the most amazing thing is for any pairwise combination you can find, um, they kind of work pretty well. And the third law is, you know, if you have any exceptions, just do it, and maybe it'll get, get, get you a paper. So this is exactly what I'm going to show next. So, okay, like combinatorial alchemy is really fruitful. Uh, again, I, I think this is only practically. I mean, we're doing a lot of things, trying a lot of things, just like Terry said. There's not, nothing wrong about it. Um, it works, um, but you know, we don't really need to understand how, how it works now, but we really do need to understand it in the future. So remark number two, I think it's really an, an a, a important question to, to answer in the future is why this kind of you know, combin, you know, very intuitive com combination can lead to very good results. All right, so a little bit constraint on what I, the, the topic right now uh, in this talk. We're talking about RNNs. RNNs trained by backpropagation through time. Okay. So we're really, um, yes, this is really early work, I would say. You can think of this as like 30 years ago. So it's, it's known that the, the, the memory, the memory by memory, I really mean some kind of internal state that you, you keep in your system that, that's, you know, that, that can be changed, but, but it keeps um, through time um, to, to, to retain information for the future. So basically, if you think about like a deep, a deep recurrent net in training, uh, there are two types of memories. One is hidden state. Of course, that's uh, the, uh, the forward activations. And the weights, the hidden states are the fast, and because it changes every time step. Recurrent weights are actually dynamically changed by the training process, um, and it's slow. 
the capacity of the hidden states scales linearly with the number of hidden units, uh, but you know, weights, it's, it's the number squared. So there are some limitations of known for like vanilla INN, RNNs. Um, from the beginning is number one, if you want to have short-term memory, you keep it in the activations. It's pretty limited because you, it has a linear scaling of, a, of a, a capacity. And um, number two is that it's very hard to have a long-term or varied um, time scale um, of memory in, in, in a network. And the third is the well-known training problem when you do backpropagation. Um, so, so can we borrow anything biological from it? So let's say if you think about a brain, um, well, neural activities will be analogous to activations. Um, synaptic weights, that will be recurrent weights. But in a biological system, just like um, you know, the spatial scale, you can think of a whole wide range of temporal scale. There are a lot of things happening in a you know, meso-temporal scale. So a lot of you know, mechanism in, in, in inside a neuron or in a circuit. So I call cellular mechanism or circuit mechanism, let's say you have those lingering calcium activities in your um, um, you know, synapses you know, after activation, uh, after um, activity. And you have a lot of kind of temporal diversity in the connections uh, in the net network. So can we borrow any idea from biology? Um, so, all right. So, uh, right, so I shall say to, the way to overcome the, the limitations of RNNs, I mean, there's, there's basically two main paths of, of that um, in, in, in the past a couple of decades. So I we'll would just label it kind of hand wavily circuit and cellular, so this clever design of recurrent neural network topologies, like gated uh, RNN um, memory cells. And there are also other type of memory enhancement uh, that's basically kind of simulating a lingering activity that maybe can be analogous to the cellular mechanisms. I'm going to talk more um, um, in, in detail in a couple, in a couple of slides later. So the first approach is the well-known is um, you know the 1997 uh, Hochreiter and Schmidt Huber paper on LSTM. So I think I probably in the interest of time I just don't go through this. And everybody knows this is this clever design of gated um, units in a in a memory cell. So that gives you a long long-term dependency and it can um, also solve the training problem. And um, I, I need to note that there's a, very, a, a, a huge bulk of li literature on later works. And these days, you see RNNs. The top performing RNNs actually in practice are very complicated. They have multiple, multiple time scales. Um, they have very complicated, sometimes even learned um, topologies. So obviously, I cannot cover that here. But most interesting and uh, what inspired uh, of our work is the second approach. The second approach is really trying to um, use memory, differentiable memory, um, that can you know, be incorporated into a deep neural network. So, so fast weight is one kind of that. So basically, this is Jeff Hinton's, um, the original uh, fast weight paper, the first fast weight paper is 1987. I think there's probably a the fourth law or, or zeroth law is like any new ideas you can come up with today, probably you'll find an original idea before Y2K. You know, this is pretty true in deep learning. And after this paper, um, another visionary in the field, Jürgen schmidt um basically proposed that, you know, this is a mechanism actually differentiable. You can actually just put it in the, the, the deep RNN and train it end to end. So fast forward to 2016 NIPS, Jimmy Bai and Jeff Hinton demonstrated a fast weight uh, RNN. So basically, uh, I will go into more, more detail when I present my net network. Basically, it's a um, Hopfield net embedded in a deep RNN that gives you a very good um, a, a substantial performance. Uh, here is a very simple toy case of an associated recall task. I'll explain what that is in the next slide. And again, there is a lot of 
you know, development before and after. And of course, there are other, another type of memory enhancement. Basically, it's a general key value store like uh, neural Turing machines. I'm not going to cover and uh, the, review the literature at all. OK, so, so the question is, the, these are two alternatives, um, gated RNNs and memory enhancement. How do they interact with each other? So this is the working question we're trying to answer here. Are they redundant? Basically, you know, there's a dominant one. You're using one, the other basically doesn't matter. Or are they competitive? Or maybe just, you know, using both will be worse than any, you know, one alone. Or are they synergistic? So you put them together, and the uh, summation is more than, than the individual. OK, so it's very easy. So we just do a fast way to LSTM. LSTM is a gated memory cell that's very popular. Um, you know, RNN architecture. So here, um, basically, you can see that uh, the fast weight, A, here, is basically just like in uh, Hinton's paper. It's somewhat like a, a fading snapshot of a uh, second-order statistic. It's basically like embedding a, a Hopfield net into um, your, your network. And there are a couple of parameters, hyperparameters, you can set here. And we made a few um, um, pretty minor, um, but significantly, um, you know, you know make, make it faster uh, a, uh, modifications from Jimmy Bass' 2016 paper. And um, so I'm not going to go too detailed that there, but these are pretty minor um, modifications. So we basically just demonstrate here with a very simple toy. Um, task that's very widely used here. It's called associative um, recall. So the, um, the training data is generated in, in such a way. It's basically a learning of associations between key, keys and pairs, uh, key, keys and value pairs. So the keys are letters here, and the, um, the values are um, uh, the, the 10 digits. So basically, you first um, sample from the space of such a function that maps, that sends a letter to a digit. And then you generate uh, a lot of these pairs. Uh, and in total, uh, k, k over 2. So k is the, num the, the, the length of this sequence. And then the two um, question marks are basically uh, just a cue for you to uh, be ready to re receive a uh, key. So this is the query key. And then uh, the target output is the value that's associated with the key. So we also did a little bit of a modification of this task. So we call it a modified associated retrieval task, basically. In this case, you show all the keys together first, and then in the same order, the corresponding values. OK? So this is in our paper. So in, this, in, the, in the original uh, task case, the, uh, t the time, uh, the temporal displacement of key value association is constantly 1. And the, re uh, the average retrieval scales with k. But in the uh, modified case, uh, both association uh, and re retrieval uh, time di distance uh, scales with k. So it's more difficult. So OK, so the, the result is. Uh, here's a pretty complex um, um, table. So basically, we're comparing three models. So fast weight LSTM is our model. We combine the two mechanisms. And layer norm LSTM is basically just an L LSTM, but with a layer norm, just to be fair, uh, a comparison, because we have layer norm in, in here. And this is the original fast weight RNN 2016 paper from Jimmy Ba. So, here is the uh, original task and modified task. K is a parameter that controls the, the difficulty. And you can see that for the original task, uh, and, and H is the number of hidden units, and the total number of parameters is, is listed on the rightmost column. And for the original task, uh, both um, you know, models with fast weights can learn pretty well uh, at a specific capacity. But if you increase the difficulty, if you make the, the task uh, harder by doing the modified task, we can see like in these parameters, uh, you know, either the fast weight vanilla RNN and LSTM failed almost utterly, but uh, fast weight uh, 
LSTM learns, still learns pretty well. And this is even true when you have a smaller model with fewer parameters. Okay. And we also found out that, you know, in addition to the, you know, the, the performance, uh, fast weight uh, LSTM also learns faster. So here is a validation accuracy um, uh, plotted against the e epoch. Okay, so last slide summary. So basically we demonstrated a strong synergy between two popular types of uh, uh, enhancement of RNNs, uh, memory, and here is the you know, fast weight associated memory and gated uh, memory cells. So specific um, observations is um, LSTM with fast weight actually trains much faster and achieves lower test error in associated retrieval tasks. And um, fast weight LSTM remains highly performant even at a very high task memory difficulties. And at that difficulty, the straw man models both fail. And this is even true for a fast weight LSTM with fewer parameters than the, um, than the models in comparison. Thank you.